And, you know, it's like, well, I sent the email, but they should be reading their email. But the reality is that if we send one email, you know, I just, if I send one email, Kevin, I do not expect um, all of my team to be on board. I, I mean, I'm, I'm sending regular communication and lots of different tools and lots of different methods, knowing that different people are going to respond to different things. And I can't, I can't, again, I can't wish everyone reads every, you know, word of my emails and, and, and digest it perfectly. I need to meet my team where they are and understand where they are and how they want to be communicated with. Let me just say two things about that. I, I was pretty confident, Dave, since we've worked together before, that the slides would be somewhat superfluous here. Um, and so I will probably zoom around and this and that and all that stuff. But here's the thing that I want to just say. Uh, first of all, for anyone who says that to me, well, they should be reading their email. I just look at them and very kindly say, do you read all of yours? Hmm. Hmm. I, I'm just saying more than that. Right. And the second thing I would, and, and I'm not judging. I'm just making a, I'm just asking a simple question. And so to think that that alone, to think, first of all, any of you that know anything about marketing and all that stuff, you know, one, one message, seldom enough for people to get it. Uh, and the second thing is communication isn't about sending messages, which is what that is. Well, I sent the email. That's not communication. Communication is message sent, message received, message understood. And so to the questions that have come in about communication tips, you just heard Dave say some of it more than once, more than one media, right? And then I would say, add, create a communication loop. And, and the third thing I would say is uh, that we communicate far more than with just the words alone, right? There's a reason why um, Dave and I are on our cameras right now. Right. Because you're getting more you're getting different communication from us because you have our cameras than if you didn't. And so I would say use your cameras. Now, I'm not saying we have to have our cameras on all the time, all day long. I think the most underutilized tool we've got right now is this thing right here used like this. Uh, but we need to recognize that to get the richness of communication, especially when we're doing it, when we can be synchronous like we are right now, that that or at least most of us, some people are going to watch a recording of this, I suppose. Uh, but the, the reality is the more modality we can get, the more, um, uh, the more what we, what we say, what we hear and what we see, uh, the better off we'll be the verbal, the vocal and the visual. Right. Yeah. And I look, I look at it as a gift, you know, the folks that I, I've heard folks say, well, you know, it's not the same and not, not being in the same room with people and I can't read them as well. And okay. But how much more can you communicate when you know you're saving two hours of commute time and all of your employees are saving two hours of commute time and you have an option to spend 10 minutes in one market and another 10 minutes in another market halfway across the globe you couldn't do that before in the in the days yeah. of the you know your offices so you know that those with every challenge comes some gifts and opportunities as well 100 percent and all of this you know uh, in, in some situations, uh, this slide wouldn't still be up, but it, it all applies because we're talking about there. It's there's more complexity for sure. But with that comes opportunity. And, and, and Dave, I think your point's a really good one right there. Right. Uh, the question comes in, can we gamify email? I, I don't know if we can gamify email, but what we can do is be clearer about what we put in emails. And again, if you're not reading them all, make sure you're writing them in ways that people will want to read them. Use bullet points, shorter emails. And be careful about how you're using email because it may not be just because it's the tool you like, just because it's the tool you are comfortable with doesn't mean it's the right tool. I, so, so Dave, I, I grew up on a farm in Michigan and um, I've used this analogy before. Like if I, if I go into the shop at the farm, I bet I've got 20 hammers. I, I probably have eight or 10 at my house, but when I go to the farm, I've got like, I got all kinds of hammers all sorts of hammers, right? I have favorite hammers. I have a, I have three different sledgehammers. I have a sledgehammer that I use with my dad a lot. It's probably my favorite hammer. And if I wanted to put a nail in the wall, the sledgehammer is not the best tool. Just because I got it doesn't mean it's the one I need to use. So we need to think about all the different communication options that we have, whether that's our phone, whether that's a, a Zoom call, whether that's a Slack or a Teams message, whether that's a text message, whether that's a video camera, whatever it is, and say, what's the right tool to get this meth to get this message delivered and understood 
And that goes back to the culture comment that someone asked earlier. We, we need to talk about that around what are our expectations about that, because we can create better communication on our organization if we stop to think about that collectively. Yeah. You want to add any more to that before we go on? No, I just uh, I'll I'll say briefly to Marie who who uh, and I and I love a good challenger uh, challenged us in the comments around so she does read all of her business emails. I, I would I would just I would um, say that's great and um, I, I would add my 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 spin on the golden rule is the platinum rule doing to others as they would like done to themselves. So even if you read all your emails, which is rare but impressive, okay, um, then the question becomes: Is it really? reasonable to expect all the team to read all of their emails if that's not what they're used to and that's not what they've grown up with and that's not what they want to do it's, it's just I mean, maybe you can you can um you maybe you can uh succeed where others fail in my experience i have to meet my team where they are and if they're not email devourers i have to think through other other methods of communication to supplement email and, and of course to make my emails better. I want to take I want to take it a step further because I, I hear Marie's point uh, that hey it's uh, my expectation is they're going to read their darned emails right that's not what she said but that's what I'm saying so here's the thing that can be your expectation and and, and I have zero problem with that and and hearing everything that Dave said about different people's preferences I'm going to when I make that sort of tongue in cheek comment that I made earlier that led you to say this, you know, do you read all your emails? And, and if you do, and you expect your team to do that, make sure it's clear that that's true. And still one method all the time is not necessarily going to mean you have, it means you sent messages. It doesn't necessarily mean that messages have been received and understood. So if that's clear to your team, I have zero problem with that. Zero problem with that. Um, but the reality is we've got to make sure that we're creating communication loops to make sure that people really are do uh, do have we do have clear communication. And I would just say that we have more tools at our disposal than just email to use. And we could get into the whole preferences thing where Dave was going around different people, you know, and, and different ages and all that stuff. And we could do all that. But even if we leave all of that out, right? So uh, we have a screen. We have a strict unsubscribe policy, but I don't think people can unsubscribe from your emails, Emily. Um, the <laughs> inbox is supposed to be ready and virtually empty. That is, that, that's awesome. And I, I can tell you that that's a really good process. And there are a lot of consultants in the world making a lot of money teaching people how to manage their email and that where that's not happening. And so I would say what Emily's saying, from a culture perspective, if that's working for you, you got a secret sauce that others of us ought to be doing. There's no doubt about it. Hundred um, yeah. percent. Let, let me let me say a little bit more about this whole complexity thing about where we are. Can I do that? Can I sort of shift? Oh, please, please shift gears here. Um, so I, I think there are three big differences about the world of work today than it used to be that makes our job as leaders harder. And the first one is that there's more than one right answer. All this complexity we've been talking about it. We've been talking about it in relationship to communication just now. But but <clears throat> Dave, when you and I came out of school. And even when we, before we went to school, we had a picture of what work was and it was built based on the nine to five, 40 hour a week model. And even if our parents worked more than that or whatever, like that's the prevalent model of the world when we were kids and when we started work. And, and so the world of work was created around the idea of nine to five, 40 hour week, weekends off the basically, thank you, Henry Ford. And the post-World War II world of what does it mean to work in an office, the organizational man sort of model. Like that's what work was. But ask a lot of these apprentices that Dave's wanting to hook you up with. That's not, they, that, that's not the world that they've even seen, let alone, and I'm not even talking about whether it's what they want. That, forget that. That's not even what they've seen. My daughter graduated from university last summer, took a job with a wonderful organization called Target to work in downtown Minneapolis at their headquarters building. She's still living in Indianapolis. She hasn't even moved yet. Now she's moving soon because she says, I need to get there, even though she's still not being asked to go to, to the office unless she wants to. She's been in the job for seven months and 
on a trip up to do house hunting, she walked in and saw what her desk would be and she got all excited. The world is just different. It's just different. We can't expect people who haven't had the same background as us to have the same perspective as us. It's just irrational, right? And the world is new and different. There's plenty of unknowns. We can talk about hybrid. No one knows exactly what that's even going to mean or what it's going to look like or how it's going to work. That just makes our job more complex, but it's part of it. And the last thing, and you said it earlier, same words, we can't go back. We can't go back to where we were. We've already covered that ground. We don't need to say more about it, but wishful thinking isn't going to get you anywhere here, everybody, right? So um, I, I would say this, that, you know, uh, Dave's written books about leadership. We've written books about leadership. And in that book, The Long Distance Leader, we say that the first rule of leading at a distance is think leadership first, location second, which means that there's a lot of stuff we already know about leading that we shouldn't forget. And what we need to be doing now is thinking about what are the nuances and differences, not saying we got to throw it all out and start over, but rather, what do we need to change? Not, oh my gosh, it all has to change. Because the underlying principles of leadership have not changed. And Dave said earlier about communication, right? That's we, we, we have to communicate. We need to be successful at it. It's going to take us longer than we think. It may be more complex than ever, but that underlying fundamental principle of leadership is still the same. Comments, sir, before we go yeah. on? Yeah, no, I, I totally agree with you. And, and, and I, I, I continue to look for opportunities based on this this new model. Um, so, so, in, so just like I've always, as a leader, tried to engage people um, and, 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 and have more dynamic, more engaged meetings, right? Because most meetings suck. Um, now, if I'm doing, if I'm leading a, 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 a meeting on Zoom, Kevin, I see this great gift I've got right in front of me. I've got the Zoom chat. So whereas, whereas if I'm leading a meeting and I'm speaking and people are listening or somebody's speaking and everyone else is listening, before it was like take notes privately, well now everyone can take notes publicly, right? We can use the Zoom chat to create much more engaged dynamic meetings than we, than we had before. So same principle, to your point, Kevin, same principle of great leadership of engaging people, but now we're layering in new tactics based on the, 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 the fact that folks are remote. Yeah, 100%. Yeah, 100%. Um, so, so we sort of promised you three secrets. Well, we're going to be way more than three secrets, but let's, let's say, okay, what do we need to do differently now specifically, right? And obviously we've been talking about some things along the way here, but what, what does successful leadership look like today? Given that first construct, it's leadership isn't completely different, but what do we need to be focusing on and thinking about now more than ever? And I'm just going to lay all these out there in one of the versions of the slides, they were all out there. So I'm going to put them all up here and then we'll, whoops, one too many. Sorry. That's totally my fault. You know, I, I teach my team. I love graduated. So I talk. I, I, I love to do it, but for our purposes right now, I want to lay them out there because then we can talk about them together. So here's the thing. Uh, because we've all lived through the last two years of working differently. And, and, and by the way, if, you're a leader sitting here saying, well, I'm in healthcare, I'm in a restaurant, I'm in a warehouse, I'm in a factory, and my people have kept, had to keep coming to work. The way people are viewing work is still different because they have friends, neighbors, spouses, and kids that have worked from home some of the time. And even though they realize that their job doesn't allow that, the way they're, the way all of us are thinking about work is fundamentally different than it's ever been before. So we have to, as leaders, be more focused on our employees, whether it's about what is it that they need, whether it is helping people under, understanding and dealing with mental health challenges and isolation and loneliness issues or whatever it is. We need to be more employee or other focused than ever. I'm going to just walk through these and let you come back. We can hit, hit on any of you want, Dave. The second one is we have to be more big picture focused. Lots of reasons. One is when the world is changing so much around us, we have to be ready to see the big picture. But the other thing is if our people are working at a distance from us, whether it's remote or hybrid, doesn't matter. If people are in a re remote, for example, it's hard for them to have the context of the big picture. With this client I was with yesterday, they said, we have this employee been here for 14 months. And they don't even really understand what the company is. They understand their job. They're doing their job really well. They don't have this bigger picture. 
They don't have any concept, really. No disrespect to that person, not even their fault. But when all you see around you are the things in your workspace and not in your workplace, you have none of that. We as leaders must be more big picture focused, help people see that bigger picture. We must be more organizationally focused, help people see that bigger picture, help people see the mission, create meaning in their work and all that. We must be more self-aware because people are still watching us, even if they can't actually see us. And we must be more self-aware because we can't just put on our achiever mindset and say, well, suck it up, buttercup. We can get through this. We have to model differently. And the last thing I will say, and then I'll just let you riff on this, sir, is that I believe that the future of work is not hybrid. The future of work is not remote. The future of work is flexible. And so we must be more flexible. Uh, what work is will mean way more different things. Shit, colors of the rainbow than it's ever meant before. Used to be work meant like one of three things, right? I worked eight hours a day. Uh, I worked in an office, I worked in, in a workplace, or I worked in a, in, in a place where the work was in front of me, a factory, a warehouse, whatever. Uh, but now it's all different. It's all different. Anything here you want to comment on? Yeah, a few things. Um, I'll start with that and work my way up with, 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 with flexibility. One, one thing that um, I think folks need to be more flexible about today um, is is and this is related to the great resignation and um just just the gig economy and all these different trends is being flexible about how and who is getting the job done so 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 10 years ago five years ago i don't know maybe even three years ago it it would have been full-time employees w2 employees that's it that's the only way and now we've got upwork we've got apprentices we've got virtual assistants, we've got contractors. There are so many part-time, there are so many different ways to get that done. So that gets into that, this idea of flexibility as leaders as to how and, and, and who, who will, will actually get the job done on the team and, and, and what that looks like. Um, talking about employee focused, uh, one, one thing that we saw with, with Apprentice is uh, a significant increase in stress and mental health issues. And um, my, my assumption, of course, is that that's relevant to, related to the, the pandemic, but it didn't really matter. We saw it and we said, okay, what, how can we address this? Um, we did two things. We brought in a program called Positive Intelligence, which I'm a big fan of, PQ, look it up, positiveintelligence.com. And we brought in a, a therapist uh, and offered, offered essentially free uh, therapy sessions, uh, confidential therapy sessions. And, and so uh, the, um, I don't have a lot of new data yet. It's relatively recent, but I'm really hopeful that that will, uh, those, those will be, um, you know, positive changes, uh, for our teams. And, uh, of course I, I agree with it, you know, the rest of what you're saying, but I don't want to use up all, all, all of your time. So I will let you move on. Well, I want to go back in, in the chat. Uh, Marie asked a fabulous question. She asked it of you, but I'm going to answer it. Uh, how do we measure productivity of the team? So let, let's let's talk about one of my favorite topics for a second around productivity as it relates to where people are working. Uh, first thing is we look at all of the research pre-pandemic. It would all say that people are more productive working at home or working alone than they are working in a in a workplace, uh, and it's pretty much consistent across the board. Uh, so people have continued to say, well, people are more productive working from home, to which I say, not necessarily so fast, my friends. First of so for a couple of reasons. Number one is we have very skewed views of that word productivity. So Dave, you said it earlier. Uh, people got their commute times back, right? The average American pre-pandemic average, 27 minute commute each way. A lot of people, a lot more than that, right? But let's just use that average. New Yorkers can double that. <laughs> I know, I know that, and, and and other places too. But I'm just going to use that number because I've I've shared that data and I've asked thousands of people this question in the last two years. So what have you done with the hour or more that you got back? Right? What are you doing with the time you used to spend commuting? Uh, so, Dave, what do you think the number one answer is? Um. 
<laughs> worked <laughs> no. 100 over 50 percent now there are other answers like exercise and time with my family and reading or personal development or hobbies like they're sleeping there's like seven other answers over 50 percent of the people are saying i'm working more so when people ask me or when i ask that question and people say well, i'm working more my question is are you getting more accomplished well, see that's not being more productive right that's being busy there's productivity is output per unit time. And we're only more productive if we're getting more done in the time we have, not if we're just throwing time at it and getting it, still getting it done. And so that's the first thing. So we measure, so to answer Marie's question directly, how do we measure productivity? Based on metrics of accomplishment, not activity. Right, outcomes. Busy is a four letter word. Outcomes. You know, I, it's, it's funny. Um, I, I don't, care how long things take i don't I, I mean from my perspective and i've always been this was pre-pandemic long i mean um maybe it's just the salesman in me but you know if you have the outcome that i need why do i care whether it takes you half an hour or four hours i i don't i don't care give me the outcome and go go golfing for three hours that's great so i uh, this idea of productivity it really to me is always about the outcomes it's 100% about outcomes. Uh, I'm looking at Beverly's question in the, in the chat here. It's 100% about outcomes. And if leaders will figure that out at here first, then we'll solve a lot of our problems we have where people are saying, I don't know if they're working. Well, are they getting their work done? That's what matters. Now, we can have conversations about are they getting it done in the way we need it done? There's there, there are the what expectations, but there are also the how expectations. Like that's a whole conversation we probably don't have time for. Um, but the biggest mistake that leaders are making is like, are they busy? Wrong question. Wrong question, right? Who cares if they're walking their dog? Are they getting their work done? Yeah. The future of work is flexible. Maybe it works better for them to work starting at 5 a.m. Maybe it works better for them to work at 10 p.m. If they're not customer facing, and as long as they're taking care of their mental health and that that's not getting in the way, why should we care? 100%. Why should we care, right? Um, and Beverly, I'm, I've read your question three times and I'm not sure I quite get it. So Dave, do you want to take, take a swing at this? Because I'm afraid that I'm, I would I'm say misinterpreting it. It, it, it's a perhaps, um, perhaps more of a rhetorical. Uh, so I think, but I think she's saying, you know, there's a lot of focus on what our employees want, you know, how much do they do the employees care what what the company wants. And I think, um, you know, for, in my, from my perspective, I, I'm, I'm all about mission, vision and core values. Um, I don't think anyone cares. I don't think a single employee cares about what my revenues will be. Uh, two years from now or three three years from now, not unless they have options. They really, truly don't care. What they do care about is mission, vision, core values. And so that's, those are the um, headlines that I share very um, frequently and with great passion. Where are we headed? Why does it matter? How can I add, how can I do something meaningful in, the, in that to help make that happen? That's what matters. Right. That's what matters. Um, I, I'm going to be very inelegant, everybody, and I'm going to go past this. I'm going to come back to some of this because I want to go to this picture right here. Hang with me. So uh, this is our model of what it means to be a leader is what we call the 3-0 model of leadership. Um, that leadership is about reaching valuable outcomes with and through others, and that we, as the individual leader, that's ourselves, play a role in that. Like how we lead, how we show up, all that matters in terms of how we reach valuable outcomes with and through others. So having said that as a basic construct, all of what, Dave, your comment was to Beverly, and all of this issue about, you know, are we supposed to bow to the needs of the employee and all of this stuff? Like what about the bit employer? Have we lost all of our leverage and all of those worries and all that angst is all about the tension between outcomes and others. So the way I like to think about that is we as leaders have an organizational responsibility to reach valuable business outcomes, but we can't do it without others. But that doesn't mean that we need to go, only to, you got to be in the office five days a week because that's how we reach valuable outcomes. And it doesn't mean whatever the heck you all want is fine. 
The right answer is dealing with that tension in a way that helps both be achieved. And it isn't And it doesn't serve us as leaders to sort of say, well, we've lost control and it's now all about the employee. That's not the point. The point is, how can we as leaders reach valuable outcomes with and through others? And it takes us doing this together. If if employees don't understand what those outcomes are and the meaning of them, to your point, Dave, they're not going to want to stay anyway. Right. So when we think about how how do we create engagement, it isn't just by giving them what they want. It's about giving them the chance to do valuable work. And so creating an engaged workforce is about helping people make a choice to say, this is where I want to be. Not this is they've got good perks here. Totally. And a very appropriate time, Kevin, to jump ahead of those slides. So I, 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 I applaud you for it. Even <laughs> now, slightly I'm inelegant not- to your point. Now I'm going to go back um, to this. I, we started to talk about this idea of the great resignation, right? There's other stuff we passed, uh, but I, I, want to, I want to just do this right now. And, and I'm doing a webinar about this next week. We'll give you a link at the end if you all want to join us uh, about this idea of, okay, so there's a great resignation. So the research says, especially in the U.S., that uh, more people are voluntarily leaving uh, than it really in sort of in history. And there's angst and hand roll, hand wringing and all that about that. And that's all true on a macro level. The qu- question is, how do we take that challenge and turn that into something valuable for us organizationally? And that picture of the three O's gives us a clue there. But I just want to make this point right here, that we are living in a moment that matters. We are living at an inflection point, And it relates to Everything we've talked about, Dave, it relates to the great resignation. And can we attract the talent that we want? And I'll come back and talk about that in a second. But it also relates to how are we going to view work, where work is done, when work is done, with whom is it being done? Are they contractors, apprentices? Are they full-time employees or not? And we're going to have to have the law catch up to some of that over time. Uh, that's a bigger picture comment. But the fact is that we all as individual uh, entrepreneurs, business owners, leaders inside of our businesses, frontline leaders, middle managers, senior leaders, doesn't matter. We all have the chance to create an an up and to the right inflection point now uh, by thinking about these bigger issues and, and applying some new skills so that we can literally create a revival in our businesses or a, a renaissance in our businesses rather than, oh my gosh, how are we going to find people to take the sit in the seats? Yeah, pretty much every, every uh, business owner that I know is dealing with this one way or the other. And to your point, some are got their heads in the sand and others are, you know, think of being open and flexible and, and creative and, um, you know, figuring it, rolling up their sleeves and, and figuring it out. And let me say something about that. Um, One of the things that happens to us as leaders, once we become a leader or we start a business or whatever it is, is that we feel like we're supposed to have the answers. Like we're supposed to be the ones to figure it out. And we spent a bunch of time in the last 45 minutes talking about all the things that are still uncertain and unknown. And we can't have all the answers. And we don't need to have all the answers. We need to bring our teams into the conversation about the when and the why and the how we're going to work and about what kind of culture that we want and all that stuff. Trying to feel like we're going to put all that pressure on our shoulders to figure that out is a false and dangerous narrative. Mm -hmm. The right answer is, how do I bring the people around me that have lived through the last two years too? together to say, how do we move forward? Doesn't mean that they are going to have all the answers either, but together we're smarter than we are individually. So totally. And, and, and there's nothing, there's nothing better than a fully engaged team uh, working towards the same, uh, you know, the same goal. 100%, right? 100%. Now there was a slide that I skipped that I should probably go back to, oh, but I, I think I should probably, I should probably let's wrap up this around the great resignation and then we'll go back to another s- skill slide before we start to wrap up. Um, And and so let me, oh, we already saw that. 
So let me uh, zoom us on past that to say, how do, we, how do we actually capitalize on this? Some thoughts about that. So the first thing that we've got to do is understand the causes. And like, there's a lot that's been written about why are people choosing to resign? Why are people choosing to leave? Like understand sort of the macro stuff around that. That's important for us to recognize. We got to figure that out, understand that. That's part. The second thing we've got to do is understand this from our personal, the needs of our folks. And you got some people that haven't left. And so there are some of you that are watching that are saying, well, thankfully, we haven't had the great resignation. Well, maybe you haven't had it yet. Doesn't mean you might not, right? Doesn't mean, right? Yeah. And Melissa, I promise I'm going to go back to that. That's what I promise to do before we go. Um, and that uh, we, need to, we need to be talking to our folks about how they're doing, what they need, what are they looking for moving forward? Not because we're going to necessarily kowtow and give every last one of those things to them, but we have to know what it is. Where is their head right now? We've got to know that. So call that stay interviews, call that part of your one-on-ones with people, whatever it is. Open up your, ask some questions, open up your ears, right? And then the, the last one is that, you know, there's been a lot of conversation, Dave, and I, I posted on, on LinkedIn about this a couple of months ago. If I was talking about the war for talent, I'm like, wrong metaphor. I, I believe the right meta- metaphor is how do we become a magnet for talent? And so how do we become the, pe- the place where people want to be? How do we attract the talent that we want? Yeah, yes, we want to keep talent. But if we're working, thinking about attracting, we're probably going to be keeping too, for the most part, right? So being a talent magnet, whether those people that are already close to us or those that are further away, uh, and of course, further away can now be a lot further away, (laughs) right? They don't have, if I'm in Peoria, it doesn't matter where they are, right? Um, Yeah, so let's let's talk about how we become a talent magnet. We need to balance the outcomes and others. That whole conversation we're having about outcomes and others, we got to figure out, work on the balance, work on the tension between those and, and, and not try to go too heavy either direction will be a much more effective magnet of talent if people recognize that we're here to achieve something important and they value those of us that are helping us make those achievements. Uh, That's a huge piece of this. The second one is we've got to engage our people and engaging our people. It's the stuff we just talked about, asking them what they think, engaging them in, bringing them into the conversation, but also recognize that engagement isn't something we do to people but something that people choose to do. So how do we help people say, I want to be here. I'm, I'm in, I'm committed. Leading for commitment rather than leading for compliance would be a way I would say that in the short amount of time that we have. Um, so the next, the next thing on this list is, is to work on that word culture. There's been a lot of discussion about organizational culture over the last 20 years, and it's been valuable. Uh, and I believe that now that the paradigm has shifted, because a lot of the times the question people are asking is, how do we get back to the culture we used to have? We could go back to our good old days conversation earlier, but the fact is, it's really about creating the culture that we need and want now. What's the, what's the aspirational culture that we want and need now? And that, that's actually a, a, about half of the book I'm writing right now, uh, conversation, but we need to be attentive to thinking about de- making decisions based on and through the lens of our culture. If we want to attract the talent that we need and you have to determine what that culture is, that's, that's organizationally related, right? So for sure. So the, the next thing on this list is that, well, they both showed up here. Here's the thing. The number one reason, great resignation, before the great resignation and long from now, the number one pe- reason people voluntarily leave a job is that they fire their boss. Yes, some people will leave for more money. Yes, there are other reasons, other extenuating circumstances. But the number one reason globally, Mac on a macro level, is that they fire their boss. So if we want to have an organization that's a talent magnet, we got to build better leadership skills. Yep. And so we can take that as a personal uh, developmental goal. We can take that as an organizational developmental goal. It's fact, straight up fact. And we've got to provide flexibility. We've already talked about that. So you want to weigh out on this? We're getting people wanting me to go, go back to slide. I slide. We will. We'll, I'll, I'll just say briefly, Kevin, on culture. Um, again, some people see 
uh, the not being in the office is a barrier to culture. And I get, I understand that. I understand you can't do happy hours quite the same way, but there's so much more about culture and remote can and hybrid can be um, uh, a, a, an opportunity for culture. I'll, I'll give you a quick example. You know, this is Black History Month. Um, our, we have a, a self-created uh, d and uh, committee uh, at, at Apprentice who uh, came to me. They said, you know, we, we want to do a, a Black History Month trivia uh, thing, uh, competition uh, on Slack. And now we're doing that every day throughout the month. There's a trivia question. It's engaging people. It's creating, it's, it's, it's really helping us build a culture um, that, that frankly, without Slack and without people communicating that way, we, we wouldn't have been able to do that in the old office, if you will. So there's a bunch of lessons in there. One is let the team determine that they want to do that and then in, empower them to do it and then use the, use a tool that will help us do it and to recognize that, in fact, we have a tool that we didn't even have. Now, we, our organization, we've been using Slack for, for a number of years, but fundamentally, you know, it hasn't been around all that long. Um, uh, Julia made a comment and it slid away from me in the chat, made a comment about uh, the fact that the fact that we can now hire people from all over is a bit a benefit rather than worrying about it. And that's exactly right. Like, like I can, I can be in Indianapolis and I can hire people in Idaho, right? I don't have to hire people in Indianapolis. In fact, my team is spread out across the United States. And of course, lots of people are looking to hire people from around the globe and that's perfectly wonderful, right? Um, so several people asked me to put this slide back up and uh, we've got about 10 minutes. I want to get back to any other final. So if you've got other questions you want to ask, put them in the chat. I'm going to leave these up here. Let me just talk about a couple of them, Dave, and let you let you pick a couple you want to talk about. How about that? Sure. Um, I, I would say that as leader, I, I'm going to talk about that first one for a second. Uh, there is very likely, if we're leading at a distance, uh, the chance that we have less connection with our folks than we used to have uh, in different ways than we had. And if you are going to be hybrid, you might have some people you're going to see way more frequently than others. And so you've got to be very aware of that. All of that leads us to, we need to have better, great one-on-ones with our folks. And, and let me give you a very simple formula to help have great one-on-ones. Number one, start the one-on, so they should be regularly scheduled and they should be locked on your calendar, not just dropping them out because you got something else because oh, yeah, they'll understand. No, they should be co-owned with the other person. This isn't your meeting with them. This is your meeting together. And then when you first thing that you do when you meet, it should be for you to have the chance to say how they're doing. Talk about the non-work first. It might be one minute. It might be five minutes. How are they doing? What's going on? This is your chance to practice empathy. This is your chance to understand how they're actually doing, what they need, all that. Next, everyone on your team should be keeping a list of things that they need to talk to you about. So after we talk about feelings and where we're at, go to their list. In my case, it's what's on your Kevin list. Mm. Then we go to my list for Dave, right? Chances are some of Dave's stuff on the Kevin list, we've now already talked about. And I'm checking them off as we go because we're in alignment. And so then we make sure we've taken care of the current business and we make sure we have time for any coaching that didn't naturally show up in the nature of that conversation, right? That's how you have, that. that's a very simple way to think about having great one-on-ones and they're more important to us now than ever. So you want to take a swing at any of those? I'll just speak about empathy for a moment. I, I, I mean, empathy, the, 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 and these are all skills that have always been important, but empathy, the reason I think it's even more important now, and I mean, I've, I'm, I'm a huge, huge proponent of the importance of empathy, is, you know, is the context uh, cues that we get when we're face to face with someone in an office are more, admittedly, right? We can see um, their, um, their fidgeting. We can see um, how they sort of present themselves overall. We can see things that we're not going to see. Um, so now, or, um, if I'm on a one-on-one -on -one with someone um, uh, on a Zoom instead, I've got to focus a little bit harder on empathy than I would have other otherwise. I have to really pay attention and really listen and really mirror and validate. And and by the way, I, I don't I don't know how much you know everyone on this call has studied empathy, but 
it, it's it's worth it. <laughs> it is. I I actually did a video this morning for my from from my sales team at Apprentice, Kevin. And I said, empathy practiced well and with sincerity is like actual magic in in uh, in 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 persuading folks. I mean, it's really valuable. It's a really valuable skill. So it is it is uh, hybrid or not. It is worth. Uh, developing more empathy, but especially in a situation where you're you're not actually in the same room with someone, it's um it's very very valuable. And so let's just here's another thing that you know. And again, we work with groups from all over the world over the last two years. What are the things that you're missing in, in, in relationships, connection, trust, or three of the things that show up all the time? Well, if we are if we truly practice empathy, what happens to to our relationship with the other person? What happens to the trust with the other person? That's why it's magic, right? That's why it's magic because it changes everything. Uh, not only do we now have new information about where they're at and understanding their perspective and seeing through their eyes, but they know we care and it changes everything. That, that's been human nature forever. That's why leadership first, location second. It's just that it's more important now than ever. Right. Uh, Beverly made a comment that says she worked for a boss to ask about my expectations and she was stumped. Here's the point. Setting clearer expectations is one that goes both ways. So we as leaders need to be better at being clear about what they are. And I believe it's more than just the what expectations, but also the why and how expectations. Um, but we need to make sure that we understand what theirs are in reverse. This is that this is that tension outcomes and others piece showing up to us again in another way. And getting better at setting clear expectations isn't just between me and my boss, but across the team. We're going to have a highly effective hybrid team, distance team, remote team, whatever word you want to use. Uh, we've got to get better at having clear expectations with each other about all sorts of stuff, including back to what we said earlier, which communication tools are we using for which things, right? When we added Slack years ago, we came up with clear sort of expectations on our team about when do we, ex when do we use Slack? And when do we use email? Because they're not the same tool. They're different hammers. So let's figure out when we're going to use each. Made all the difference. Yeah. Right? Um, we got other stuff showing up down here. I know we got to get to a, a, a couple of final slides here. Um, highly skilled women who don't want to work part-time. There you go. So uh, I, I love that. That's great stuff, Emily. Thank you. Um, and Dave's got a comment there too. So, so let me just, I'm going to just take us right down here to the end because we only have a couple more minutes. Um, things we've all talked about. One more chance, if you've got any questions, uh, put them in there. We got a couple more minutes there, but I'm gonna put this, uh, I'm gonna share the three secrets while you're thinking about your, you know, since we promised three, you're like, what, what are you gonna say here, Kevin? Because you, you and David talked about 412 things. Um, there's a comment from LinkedIn here. Let's see, remote is affecting different industries differently. What are your words on this? You wanna take that first? Sure. I mean, I, yes, everything will affect different industries differently. But the some of the, the, the principles that we've talked about, I, I would argue, uh, apply no matter what industry you're in, uh, some more than others. You know, I think, again, not knowing the context here, what I, what I will just say is, from previous experiences that sometimes I get, well, I'm in this industry. How does this really apply? Well, I'm in this industry. You know, I don't have... I don't have experience working in every industry on the planet. So, so that, that's my first caveat. That being said, in my experience, um, uh, folks would be surprised when we really dig deep, we, we see a lot of similarities across industries. That's sort of my it, perhaps vague answer, but I, I don't know the full context of the question. 90-10. It's 90% the same, same and 10% different. And, uh, and the reason it's 90% the same is because it's all about humans. Now, are there differences? Of course there are. Are there specific constructs? Of course there are. But if we only focus on those things, we miss all the stuff that's common and we miss the chance to, to, to move beyond the stuff that's, well, not in my business. My business is different. Our industry is different. We got to be really careful with that. Yeah, it's a yes and. So what are the three secrets? Are you ready, Dave? You saw the slide. Yes, let's do it. Uh, slide number one. The, the, the secrets are the skills that you develop are going to make the difference. And we've hinted at a number of those things. The second secret is that the culture that you co-create 
is going to make the difference. If this is an inflection point, if this, this is, we are living in an inflection point. The only question is, are you going to inflect the way you want or not? And it's the skills that you develop as leaders, as a team, the culture that you co-create with your team. And then lastly, the, co- the social construct of work has changed. What people expect from work, the, the need for, the desire for, the, to, to better figure out how to balance work and life, all of that. The fact that we're working in places that weren't designed for working and a hundred other things. When we start to understand that as those three things, we've got a chance to be successful in 2022 and beyond. And you've got some, you've got some resources for people. And we've got one as well. I hinted at it. So what, but what should people do first besides take advantage of the things on the final slide? Well, you should keep your head up. Keep looking out and up and not just down. The second thing that you should do is to assess your skills so that you can say, where am I on the things that Dave and I talked about today uh, and, and more and, and then decide what you're going to do about it. Engage with your team because you don't need to have all the answers, right? And, and invest in your team. Let's say if you do those four things, you'll be heading in the right direction. And one of the ways that you can invest in yourself and invest in your team, tell them about this thing. It's through Apprentice. So our our Apprentice is our official sponsor here. Um, You know, personally, I have three apprentices who make my life so much easier by doing all the tasks that I don't want to do and aren't, you know, the most valuable use of my time so that I can focus on partnering with Kevin to do awesome webinars like this and, 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 and working really on my leadership skills. So if you want to focus on the most important things and delegate and outsource the less important tasks, um, I'd love for you to, to learn more about Apprentice. You can go to chooseapprentice.com or you can use our special link today if you want 40 hours free, remoteleadership.live to learn more about uh, remote leadership. You go to remoteleadership.live. And when you sign up to learn more, uh, just, um, just mention remote leadership and, uh, we will be sure to give you 40 hours free. If you uh, join us, somebody asked the presentation slides will be emailed. Absolutely. If you signed up for this webinar, um, uh, we will email to you recording and the slides. And if you, um, if you, uh, are watching, live on LinkedIn and you didn't sign up for the webinar, well then uh, even send me an email, uh, uh, Dave at chooseapprentice.com and I will get you all of the slides. Uh, Kevin's got another webinar coming up. Yeah, next week we're doing it twice because we got folks around the world. So we're doing it at 9 a.m. and at 3 p.m. Eastern times. Uh, and there it is, uh, kevinacanbury.com, the great resignation webinar. The link is there uh, and, and we'd love to have you join us. We're going to dive into it. Some very di- some of the some of the themes you heard today will be there, but we're going to go a lot deeper in a lot of areas that we didn't have the chance to talk about today. We'd love to have you join us for that. And I and I, I'll say this for Dave and I both, and that is that you know if you don't follow us on LinkedIn, why not uh, follow us or connect with us on LinkedIn? Do that. And so and if you if you don't have a chance to get that link, it's in the slides. But if you miss it, you can send me a note in LinkedIn. I'll be happy to get you the link for that. Um, Dave, thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to be with you, sir. Thank you so much for being here. It's always great to see you, Kevin, and such great insights, such great knowledge. I, I am really grateful uh, uh, for, for, for our relationship and that I can learn from you uh, to, and work on my own leadership skills. Frank, selfishly, that's why I do this. It's not to teach you all, it's to learn from this guy. So thank you. Thank you much. And thank you all for joining us today. Um, it's been a pleasure, and I wish you a wonderful rest of your day. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye.